Melissa was buzzing with excitement as the cowboys rode in on their bareback horses, bringing in more horses and burros. Some of the horses were concealed in the crags while the burros were loaded up and sent down the trail with a cowboy. Nick Steele and Monty returned, followed by Norris, who clambered down the break between the cliffs. He ordered all the baggage belonging to Vienna and her guests to be taken up the cliff using lassos to haul them up. "'Get ready to climb,' Norris said to Vienna's party. "'Where?' asked Melissa, shocked. Norris gestured towards the ascent that needed to be made, causing Vienna and her guests to gasp in dismay. "'Mr. Norris, is there danger?' asked Dorothy, her voice trembling. This was the same question Vienna wanted to ask Norris, but she couldn't bring herself to say it. No, there's no danger, replied Norris, but we're taking precautions we all agreed on as the best. Dorothy whispered that she believed Norris was lying. Mountcastle and Harvey asked their own questions, while Mrs. Beck timidly made an inquiry. Please keep quiet and do as you're told, Norris said bluntly. As the last of the baggage was being hauled up the cliff, Monty approached Vienna and removed his sombrero. His black face looked the same, but he was a vastly different person. "'Miss Florentino, I'm giving notice I'm resigning my job,' Monty said. "'Monty, what do you mean? What does Nels mean now when danger threatens?' Vienna asked. "'We're quitting, that's all,' Monty replied tersely. He was stern and somber, unable to stay still, his eyes scanning everywhere. Mountcastle stood up abruptly from the log he had been sitting on, his face flushed with anger. Mr. Price, what the hell does all this commotion mean? Are we about to be robbed or attacked by a bunch of ragtag gorillas? he demanded. You've made your bet, replied Dorothy, her face turning pale. Mr. Price, you wouldn't leave us now, would you? You and Mr. Nels? Dorothy trailed off, her voice shaking. Leave you? What are you talking about? Monty asked, confused. Dorothy is worried that you and Nels will desert us when we need you the most, Mountcastle interjected. Monty let out a short, bitter laugh as he gave Dorothy a strange look. Me and Nels are pretty scared, and we're going to leave. It hurts us to see nice young girls like you dragged off by the hair. Dorothy let out a cry and began to hysterically sob. Mountcastle was finally fully awake. You and your partner are cowards, he spat. Where is that courage you bragged about? Monty's face twisted in extreme sarcasm. Duke, I've seen some bright guys in my time, but you take the cake. It's amazing how smart you are. You'll have a great story to tell your English friends if you don't get kidnapped and tied to a cactus bush in Mexico. You'll tell them about how you saw two old-time gunmen run like scared rabbits from a group of Mexicans. Unless, of course, you lie like you did when you talked about poking a lion. That story always— Monty, shut up! Norris yelled as he approached them. Monty slouched away, muttering curses to himself. Vienna and Melissa, with the help of Mountcastle, worked to calm Dorothy down. Norris walked by several times without acknowledging them, and Monty, who had been so eager to attend to Dorothy earlier, didn't even seem to notice her. It was rude and strange, even for Monty. Vienna was unsure of what to do when Norris instructed the cowboys to head to the top of the open space in the cliff and lower lassos. Without much explanation, he urged the women to climb up the rugged ladder of stones. "'We need to hide you,' he explained when they hesitated. If the gorillas come, we'll tell them you've all gone down to the ranch. If we have to fight, you'll be safe up there. Melissa bravely stepped forward and allowed Norris to loop a lasso around her and tighten it. He signaled to the cowboys above, Just walk up now, and Melissa easily scaled the steep passage. The men climbed up unassisted, but Mrs. Beck began to experience hysteria and had to be half dragged up. Norris supported Dorothy with one arm while holding onto the lasso with the other. Ambrose had to carry Christine, but the Mexican women required no assistance. Lorraine Wayne and Vienna climbed last, and when they reached the top, Vienna saw a narrow bench covered in shrubs and overshadowed by large, leaning crags. There were holes in the rock and dark fissures leading back, making it a rugged and wild place. Tarpaulins, bedding, food, and water were then hauled up, and the cowboys instructed Vienna and her friends to be as quiet as possible— avoid making a light and sleep-dressed, ready for travel at a moment's notice. Once the cowboys had left, the group was left in the darkening twilight, feeling uneasy. Mountcastle convinced them to eat, but Melissa whispered, This is simply great, while Dorothy moaned, It's awful. It's your fault, Melissa. You prayed for something to happen. 
Mrs. Beck suspected the cowboys of playing a horrid trick on them. Vienna reassured her friends that they were not being tricked and expressed concern for their discomfort. But deep down she felt uneasy. The sudden change in demeanor and appearance of her cowboys had caught her off guard. The last glance she had of Norris's face, which was stern and almost sad, only added to her apprehension. Darkness fell quickly, and the coyotes began their mournful howls. The stars shone brightly, and the wind rustled through the pines. Mount Castle paced back and forth in front of the overhanging rock where his companions sat lamenting. He then walked out to the ledge of the bench. Below, the cowboys had built a fire, and its light cast a large fan-shaped glow. Curious and anxious, Vienna joined Mount Castle and peered down from the cliff. She could occasionally make out a word spoken by the cowboys, who were casually cooking and eating. Vienna noticed the absence of Norris and pointed it out to Mount Castle. In response, Mount Castle silently pointed almost straight down. There, in the gloom, stood Norris with two staghounds at his feet. Suddenly, Nick Steele raised a warning hand, and the cowboys bent their heads to listen. Vienna strained to hear every sound. She heard one of the hounds whine, followed by the faint sound of horse hooves. Nick spoke again and turned back to his supper, and the other cowboys appeared to relax. The sound of hooves grew louder, and soon the rider Nels entered the grove and then the circle of light. Nels dismounted, and the sound of his low voice just reached Vienna. Gene, it's Nels. Something's happening, one of the cowboys called out softly. Send him over, Norris replied. Nels stalked away from the fire. Government will do something about it some day, but in the meantime, it's up to us to protect ourselves. Norris and Nels continued to discuss their options, including the possibility of leaving the area altogether. They knew they couldn't trust anyone, not even the forest ranger who had given them the information about Pat Haw and the Mexican gang. They had to rely on their own instincts and skills to survive. Vienna listened to their conversation with growing unease. She had come to this remote part of the country seeking adventure, but she had not anticipated getting caught up in a dangerous situation like this. She wondered if she should try to leave and find her own way back to civilization, but she knew that would be risky, too. As the sun began to set, Norris and Nels decided to set up a watch rotation for the night. They would take turns keeping watch and making sure no one snuck up on them. Vienna volunteered to take a turn, but Norris shook his head. No, miss, you stay put. We don't want to put you in any danger. Just keep your head down and stay quiet. Vienna nodded, feeling both grateful and frustrated. She wanted to prove she was capable of handling herself, but she knew they were right. She was an outsider in this world, and she had to respect their rules. As night fell and the stars came out, Vienna listened to the sounds of the wilderness around her. She could hear the rustling of leaves, the chirping of crickets, and the occasional hoot of an owl. But she also knew that danger lurked nearby, and she couldn't help but feel a sense of dread. She closed her eyes and tried to steady her breathing. She knew she had to stay alert and ready for anything. She didn't know what the future held, but she was determined to face it with courage and resilience. The cavalry and the good old states may not know it, but us, you, me, Monty, and Nick, we know what that rebel war down there really amounts to. It's guerrilla warfare, and it's a harvest time for a lot of cheap thieves and outcasts, said Nels. Oh, you're right, Nels, I'm not disputing that, replied Norris. If it wasn't for Miss Florentino and the other women, I'd rather enjoy seeing you and Monty take on that bunch. I'm thinking I'd be glad to meet Don Carlos. But Miss Florentino? Why, Nels, a woman like her would never recover from the sight of real gunplay, let alone any stunts with a rope. These Eastern women are different. I'm not belittling our Western women. It's in the blood. Miss Florentino is— Sure she is, interrupted Nels. But she's got a damn sight more spunk than you think she has, Jean Norris. I'm no thick-skulled cow. I'd hate something powerful to have Miss Florentino see any rough work, let alone me and Monty starting something. And me and Monty will stick to you, Jean, as long as seems reasonable. Mind, old fella, begging your pardon, you're sure stuck on Miss Florentino and over-tender not to hurt her feelings or make her sick by letting some blood. We're in bad here, and maybe we'll have to fight. Save, senor? Well, we do. You can just gamble that Miss Florentino will be game. And I'll bet you a million pesos that if you got going once and she saw you as I've seen you, well, I know what she'd think of you. This old world hasn't changed much. Some women may be white-skinned and soft-eyed and sweet-voiced and high-souled, but they all like to see a man. Jean, here's your game. Let Don Carlos come along. Be civil. If he and his gang are hungry, feed them. Take even a little overbearing greaser talk. 
be blind if he wants his gang to steal something. Let him think the women have wandered down to the ranch. But if he says you're lying, if he even looks around to see the women, just jump him like you jumped Pat Hall. Me and Monty will hang back for that. And if your strong bluff doesn't work, if the Don's gang even thinks of flashing guns, then we'll open up. And all I have to say is if those greasers stand for real gunplay, they'll be the first I've ever seen, said Nels. Nels, there are white men in that gang, said Norris. Sure, but me and Monty will be thinking of that. If they start anything, it'll have to be quick, replied Nels. All right, Nels, old friend, and thanks, replied Norris. Nels returned to the campfire, and Norris resumed his silent guard. Vienna led Mount Castle away from the wall's brink. By Jove, cowboys are strange folk, exclaimed Mount Castle. Indeed, you are right, replied Vienna. I cannot understand them. Come, let us tell the others that Nels and Monty were only talking and do not intend to leave us. Dorothy, at least, will be less frightened if she knows. Dorothy was somewhat comforted. The others, however, complained of the cowboy's odd behavior. More than once, the idea was suggested that an elaborate trick had been concocted. Upon general discussion, this idea gained ground. Vienna did not combat it because she saw that it tended to a less perturbed condition of mind among her guests. Mountcastle, for once, proved that he was not absolutely obtuse and helped along the idea. They sat talking in low voices until a late hour. The incident now began to take on the nature of Melissa's long-yearned-for adventure. Some of the party even grew merry in a subdued way. Then, gradually, one by one, they grew tired and went to bed. Melissa vowed that she could not sleep in a place where there were bats and crawling things. Vienna couldn't help but feel like she was the only one awake as she stared up at the dark overhang of rock and the starry sky above. She tried to distract herself from thinking about Norris and the anger he had stirred in her, but his memory kept creeping back into her mind, causing a commotion in her chest that she couldn't ignore. During the day she could push aside the realization of Norris's deceit, but at night, with the eerie stillness and looming shadows, Vienna struggled to control her thoughts and emotions. The night was different from the practicality of the day, and Vienna found herself battling with a nagging thought. She had overheard Nels's conversation with Norris, hoping to hear some good news or the worst, and unfortunately she learned both. Norris had complex motives, including wanting to spare her from seeing anything that might offend or disgust her. Yet this same man had a secret rendezvous with Benita, a pretty and abandoned woman. The hot shame of it all made Vienna's thoughts come to an abrupt end. She couldn't control or understand her feelings and eventually drifted off to sleep. Suddenly she was awakened by the bright and cool light of day breaking and the sun still below the eastern crags. Ambrose and a group of cowboys had brought up spring water, coffee, and cakes for Vienna's party. Despite their night's experience, the group seemed to be in good spirits. However, Ambrose warned them to be quiet as they were expecting company. This caused some anxiety, and Vienna insisted on staying near a cliff projection where she could see the camp below. Vienna asked Ambrose if he believed the gorillas would come, to which he replied, Sure, we know. Nels just rode in and said they were on their way up. He then asked Vienna to promise not to make any noise if there was a fight, and to keep out of sight as Norris had instructed him. Vienna arranged her coat to lie upon and settled down to wait for developments. Melissa suddenly appeared with a cowboy and told Vienna she was going to see what happened. Ambrose swore at the cowboy for letting Melissa get away from him, but he disappeared into the rocks. Ambrose then prepared to carry Melissa back to the others. With fury in her eyes, Melissa whispered, Let go of me. What does this fool mean, princess? Vienna chuckled, knowing that Melissa was usually imperious and not one to whisper. Vienna explained the situation to her, and Melissa declared, I might run, but I'll never scream. Ambrose had no choice but to let her stay, but he found a safer spot for her farther back from Vienna's position. He sternly warned her to remain silent and then comforted Christine before returning to Vienna's hiding place. As he arrived, Ambrose whispered, I hear horses. The gorillas are coming. Vienna's hiding spot was well protected and gave her a commanding view of the camp circle and its immediate surroundings. She could not see too far to the right or left due to the obstructing foliage. The sound of horses' hooves quickened her pulse as she focused on the cowboys below. Although she had some idea of what Norris and his men were up to, she was not prepared for their indifference. 
Frank was either asleep or pretending to be while three cowboys were lazily attending to campfire duties. Nick Steele sat with his back to a log, smoking his pipe, and another cowboy had just brought the horses closer to camp. Nels was fussing over a pack and Norris was rolling a cigarette. The elaborate set of aluminum plates, cups, and other camp fixtures that had served Vienna's party had disappeared. Monty seemed to have nothing better to do than whistle loudly, but not very melodiously. The entire group gave off an air of carelessness and indifference. As the sound of horses' hooves grew louder and slowed, one of the cowboys pointed down the trail. Several of his comrades turned their heads briefly before returning to their tasks. Soon a shaggy, dusty horse carrying a lean, ragged, dark rider rode into camp and stopped. Another horse followed, and then another. Horses with Mexican riders came in a single file and stopped behind the leader. The cowboys looked up while the gorillas looked down. Buenos dias, senor, ceremoniously said the foremost gorilla. Vienna strained to hear the voice and recognized it as belonging to Don Carlos. His graceful bow to Norris was also familiar, otherwise she would not have recognized the former elegant vaquero in this uncouth, roughly dressed Mexican. Norris replied to the greeting in Spanish, then waved his hand towards the campfire, adding in English, Get down and eat. The gorillas eagerly complied. They crowded around the fire, then spread out in a small circle and sat on the ground, placing their weapons beside them. They looked similar to the band of gorillas that had taken Vienna up into the foothills, only this group was larger and better armed. The men were just as hungry, wild, and beggarly. The cowboys were not warm in their welcome, but they were hospitable. The law of the desert was to give food and drink to wayfaring men, whether lost or hunted or hunting. There's twenty-three in that outfit, whispered Ambrose, including four white men, a pretty strange group. They seem friendly enough, whispered Vienna. Things down there aren't always what they seem, replied Ambrose. Vienna, let me explain to you, this is my chance. As long as you let me watch them, please let me know what's really going on. Sure. Listen up, Miss Florentino, warned the cowboy. If Jean ever finds out I let you snoop around and spill the beans, I'll be in hot water. But I'll tell you this much. Jean has a soft spot for those poor devils and always makes sure they get a decent meal. Don't be fooled by those so-called bandits across the border. They're just a bunch of riffraff outlaws. And as for their rebel bluff, I won't believe it until I see it. Those greasers are nothing but hard-riding thieves who would steal a man's blanket or tobacco without a second thought. Jean thinks they're after you ladies to kidnap you, but I reckon they're just after our valuables. Despite their dubious intentions, Don Carlos and his men didn't hesitate to chow down on the generous spread of food that had been laid out for them. Each man ate his fill and then some, chatting and laughing like a bunch of rowdy parrots. But as they lit up their cigarettes and surveyed the camp and its surroundings, a subtle shift took place. They seemed to be waiting for something. Senor, began Don Carlos, addressing Norris with a sweep of his hat. Vienna couldn't make out what he said, but his gesture suggested he was asking about the rest of the cowboys. Norris replied and gestured down the trail, indicating that they had all gone home. As he turned away to attend to his duties, the guerrilla leader smoked quietly, looking cunning and thoughtful. His men grew restless, their once languid cigarette puffs now quick and impatient. A man with a large build, a bullet-shaped head, and a red face that looked as if it had been burned by the sun, stood up and tossed his cigarette aside. He was American. "'Hey, buddy,' he called out in a loud voice. "'You gonna share a drink with us?' "'My boys don't carry alcohol on the trail,' Norris replied, turning to face the gorillas. "'Ha, ha, I heard over in Rodeo that you were getting to be a real temperance man,' said the man with a laugh. "'I hate drinking water, but I guess I'll have to do it.' He went to the spring, lay down to drink, and suddenly plunged his arm into the water to retrieve a basket. The cowboys, in their haste to pack, had forgotten to remove the basket, which contained bottles of wine and liquor for Vienna's guests. They had been submerged in the spring to keep them cold. The gorilla fumbled with the lid, opened it, and then got up, letting out a loud roar of delight. Norris made a barely noticeable movement, as if he was about to leap forward, but he stopped himself. After a quick glance at Nels, he said to the gorilla, Looks like my party forgot that. You're welcome to it. The gorillas swarmed around the man who had found the bottles like bees. There was a cacophony of voices. 
The alcohol didn't last long, and it only served to free the spirit of recklessness. The white outlaws began to roam around the camp, and some of the Mexicans did the same. Others waited, their ill-concealed anticipation betraying their thoughts. Vienna was puzzled by the demeanor of Norris and his companions. They didn't seem to be anxious or even interested. Don Carlos, who had been covertly observing them, now scrutinized them openly, even aggressively. He looked from Norris to Nels and Monty and then to the other cowboys. As some of his men scouted the area, the others kept their eyes on their leader, giving off an ominous vibe. The guerrilla chief appeared uncertain but not confused. When he turned to Nels and Monty, his sly face showed indecisiveness. Vienna was too excited to hear Ambrose's quiet whispers clearly, but she tried to divert her attention from the scene below to the cowboy next to her. Ambrose's tone had changed, becoming slightly hissing. Don't be alarmed if I suddenly cover your eyes, Miss Florentino, he said. Something's happening down there. I've never seen Gene so calm. That's a bad sign for him. And look, see how the boys are working together. It's slow and unplanned, but it's definitely not an accident. Even that sneaky Mexican knows it. But perhaps his men don't. If they're smart, they won't care. The Don is worried, though. He's not paying Jean much attention, but he's watching Nels and Monty. And he should. There, Nick and Frank have settled on that log with Bully. They don't seem to be carrying guns, but notice how heavy their vests hang. There's a gun on each side. Those boys can draw their guns and jump over that log faster than you can imagine. Do you see how Nels, Monty, and Jean are standing between the gorillas and the trail up here? It doesn't seem intentional, but it is. Look at Nels and Monty. They're talking quietly, ignoring the gorillas. I saw Monty look at Jean, and then Nels looked at Jean. It's up to Jean now, and they'll support him. I bet you, Miss Florentino, there would be dead Mexicans around that camp long ago if Nels and Monty weren't loyal to Jean. That's clear. It's a sight that brings a grin to my face, watching them with their two forty-fives on their hips, swaying as they walk. Twenty-four shots between the two of them and only twenty-three gorillas. If Nels and Monty ever decide to use those guns at close range, there won't be a single greaser left standing. Ah, there's Nora saying something to the Don. Wonder what it could be. Probably trying to get the Don's men all bunched up together. Those greasers ain't too bright, but the white gorillas seem a bit uneasy. Whatever's about to happen, it'll be soon. Wish I was down there to see it all go down. But maybe Norris is trying to avoid a fight. He's good at getting his way. Still, I'd love to see him take down that arrogant greaser. Look at the Don, he's clueless. These cowboys are throwing him off his game. If Gene doesn't knock some sense into him soon, he'll start to lose his fear of Nels and Monty. But Gene will pick the right moment. I'm getting antsy. I want something to happen. I've only seen Nels in one fight, but he shot a greaser's arm off for trying to draw on him. And Monty, he's the real deal when it comes to gunslingers. Those stories he told the Englishman don't even come close to what he's done. I don't get how he stays so calm with this crew looking for trouble. Oh, here we go, the grand bluff. Looks like there won't be a fight after all. The guerrilla leader has stopped his pacing and turned to Norris with a look of determination. Thanks, sir, he says. Goodbye, he said tipping his hat towards the trail leading down the mountain to the ranch. A sly grin spread across his dark face. Ambrose whispered to Vienna, barely audible, If that Mexican goes that way, he'll find our horses and figure out our plan. But I doubt he'll even try. Norris stood up slowly and confidently, taking a few long strides towards Don Carlos. Go back where you came from, he yelled, his voice ringing like a bugle. Ambrose nudged Vienna, his whisper urgent and quick. Watch closely, Jean's calling him. Whatever's going to happen will happen fast. Vienna watched as Nels and Monty stood silently, their muscles tensed, watching the Mexican closely. Look at them, ready to pounce. They're watching the Mexicans every move, Ambrose whispered. There's not a hair's breadth between those Mexicans and hell. Don Carlos gave Norris a long, hateful stare before throwing his head back, smiling wickedly and showing his teeth. Senor, he began, but before he could finish, Norris was on him, wrestling him to the ground. Vienna could barely follow the fight, but she could hear the heavy blows and see the ferocity in Norris's eyes. Finally, Norris stood back, crouching with his hands on his guns, yelling and thundering at the gorillas. Vienna felt a chill run down her spine at the menace in his voice and the threat of violence in his stance. She had to keep her eyes open, even though it was terrifying. 
In an instant, Nels and Monty were by Norris's side, their hands on the butts of their guns. Nels let out a piercing yell that mixed with Monty's roar of rage, creating an echo that reverberated off the crags. The three men crouched like tigers ready to pounce, and their silence was more menacing than their yells. The gorillas wavered and broke, running for their horses. Don Carlos rolled over, rose, and staggered away to be helped onto his mount. He looked back, his pale and bloody face that of a thwarted demon. The whole band quickly got into action and was gone in a moment. I knew it, declared Ambrose. I've never seen a greaser who could face gunplay. That was intense. And Monty Price never even drew his gun. He'll never get over that. Miss Harnman, we're lucky to have avoided trouble. Jean had it under control, as you saw. We need to get to the ranch as soon as possible. Why? whispered Vienna, her breath shaky. She realized she was weak and shaken. Because those gorillas are sure to get their nerve back and come after us, either by sneaking on our trail or ambushing us, replied Ambrose. That's their way. Three cowboys wouldn't be able to bluff a whole gang like that if it weren't for Jean knowing the nature of greasers. They're all white-livered. But we're in more danger now than before unless we get a good start down the mountain. There, Jean's calling. Come on, hurry. Melissa had slipped down from her vantage point and had missed the end of the confrontation. It seemed like her desire for excitement was satisfied as her face was pale and she trembled when she asked if the gorillas were gone. I didn't see the end, but those yells were enough for me, she said. Ambrose quickly led the three women down the rough rocks towards the cowboys who were saddling their horses in haste. It was apparent that all the horses had been brought out of hiding. Quickly and without concern for anything else, Vienna, Melissa, and Christine were lowered by lassos and half carried down to the level. Once they were safely down, the rest of the party appeared on the cliff above. They seemed to be in high spirits, treating the situation as a joke. Ambrose assisted Christine onto a horse and rode off through the pines, while Frankie Slade did the same with Melissa. Norris led Vienna's horse up to her, helped her mount, and sternly told her to wait. As soon as one of the women reached the level, they were placed on a horse and swiftly taken away by a cowboy escort. There was little conversation, and speed seemed to be the main priority. The horses were urged on, and once in the trail, spurred into a swift trot. A cowboy arrived with four pack horses, which were quickly loaded with the party's belongings. Mount Castle and his companions mounted their horses and galloped off to catch up with the others in the lead. This left Vienna behind with Norris, Nels, and Monty. They're going to switch off at the holler that heads near the trail a few miles down, Nels explained as he tightened his saddle girth. That holler leads into a big canyon. Once in there, it'll be every man for himself. I reckon there won't be anything worse than a rough ride. Nels smiled reassuringly at Vienna, but didn't speak to her. Monty took her canteen, filled it with water from the spring, and hung it over the pommel of her saddle. He put a couple of biscuits in the saddlebag and said, don't forget to take a drink and a bite as you're riding along. And don't worry, Miss Princess. Norris will be with you, and Nels and I will be hanging on the back trail. His somber and sullen face didn't change in its strange intensity, but the look in his eyes was one that Vienna knew she would never forget. Alone with the three men, stripped of all pretense, she realized how lucky she was, but also how much danger still loomed. Norris hopped onto his big black horse, spurred him, and whistled. At the sound, Princess leaped into action, cantering after Norris. Vienna glanced back to see Nels already on his horse with Monty handing him a rifle, but then the trees blocked her view. Once they hit the trail, Norris's horse broke into a gallop. Princess kept up, matching the black's pace. Norris warned Vienna about the low, wide branches that could knock her off her horse. The fast ride through the forest on a crooked, obstructed trail kept her alert, but it also stirred her blood, always susceptible to the spirit and motion of a ride especially one of danger. The throb and burn in her veins pushed away the worry, dread, and coldness that had weighed her down. Soon Norris veered off the trail at a right angle and entered a hollow between two low bluffs. Vienna saw tracks in the open patches of ground. Here Norris's horse slowed to a brisk walk. The hollow deepened, narrowed, and became rocky, full of logs and brush. Vienna used all her keenness and needed it to keep close to Norris. She didn't think about him or her own safety. Her focus was on keeping Princess close in the tracks of the black, eluding the sharp spikes in the dead brush and avoiding the treacherous loose stones. Finally, Vienna came to a halt when Norris and his horse blocked the trail. 
She looked up to see they were at the head of a canyon that yawned below and widened its gray-walled, green-patched slopes down to a black forest of fir. The drab foothills contrasted with the forest below, and in the distance the desert appeared rosy and smoky. Vienna averted her gaze and spotted pack horses crossing an open space a mile below. She thought she saw the staghounds as well. Norris, with his dark eyes, scanned the high slopes along the craggy escarpments. Then he rode down the slope on his black horse. If there was a trail left by the leading cowboys, Norris didn't follow it. Instead, he led off to the right, zigzagging an intricate course through the roughest ground Vienna had ever ridden over. He crashed through cedars, threaded a tortuous way among boulders, made his horse slide down slanting banks of soft earth, and picked a slow and cautious progress across weathered slopes of loose rock. Vienna followed, finding this ride a test of her strength and judgment. On an ordinary horse, she would never have kept up with Norris's trail. It was the dust and heat, a parching throat that made Vienna think of time, and she was amazed to see the sun sloping to the west. Norris never stopped, never looked back, never spoke. He must have heard the horse close behind him. Vienna remembered Monty's advice about drinking and eating as she rode along. The worst part of that rough travel came at the bottom of the canyon. Dead cedars, brush, and logs were easy to pass compared to the miles of loose boulders. The horses slipped and stumbled. Norris proceeded with extreme caution. Finally, when the canyon opened into a level forest of firs, the sun was setting red in the west. Norris quickened the pace of his horse. After a mile or so of easy travel, the ground began to fall decidedly, sloping in numerous ridges with draws between. Soon night shadowed the deeper gullies. Vienna was refreshed by the cooling of the air. Norris traveled slowly now. The barks of coyotes seemed to startle him. Often he stopped to listen. And during one of those intervals the silence was broken by sharp rifle shots. Vienna was disoriented as she tried to determine their location. Norris seemed both scared and confused, dismounting from his horse and moving forward cautiously. Vienna thought she heard a cry in the distance, but convinced herself it was just a coyote. Norris led the horses through rough terrain, stopping frequently to listen for any signs of danger. As darkness fell, they stumbled upon a log cabin with dark trees looming in the background. Norris disappeared inside briefly, lighting a match to explore the abandoned dwelling. He emerged shortly after, removing the saddles from the horses and leading Vienna inside. The cabin was sparse, with only a rough fireplace and hewn logs for decoration. Norris muttered about being able to ride bareback, hinting at the possibility of danger ahead. Norris's saddle and blanket lay on the hard-packed earthen floor. Take a rest, he said. I'm going into the woods for a bit to listen. Won't be gone long. Vienna had to feel around in the dark to locate the saddle and blanket. When she finally lay down, she felt grateful for the sense of ease and relief that came with resting her body. However, her mind was a maze of sensations and thoughts. All day she had helped her horse, but now the night, the silence, the proximity of Norris and his strange, stern caution, and the possible happenings to her friends all claimed their share of her attention. She went over them all with lightning swiftness of thought. She believed, and she was sure Norris believed, that her friends had not been headed off in their travel by any of the things which had delayed Norris. This conviction lifted the suddenly returning dread from her breast. As for herself, she somehow had no fear, but she could not sleep, nor did she try to. Norris's soft steps sounded outside. His dark form loomed in the door. As he sat down, Vienna heard the thump of a gun that he laid beside him on the sill, then the thump of another as he put that down, too. The sounds thrilled her. Norris's wide shoulders filled the door. His finely shaped head and strong stern profile showed clearly an outline against the sky. The wind waved his hair. He turned his ear to the wind and listened. Motionless, he sat for what seemed like hours to Vienna. Then the stirring memory of the day's adventure, the feeling of the beauty of the night, and a strange, deep-seated, sweetly vague consciousness of happiness portending were all burned out in hot, pressing pain at the remembrance of Norris's disgrace in her eyes. She felt a shift in her emotions. The anger she had directed towards herself had transformed into sorrow for him. He was an extraordinary man, and she couldn't help but acknowledge the debt she owed him. However, she couldn't express her gratitude or even speak to him. She struggled with an inexplicable bitterness. 
Vienna closed her eyes and rested. Time didn't seem to pass quickly or slowly. Norris interrupted her thoughts by calling her name. She opened her eyes to see the gray dawn sky. She got up and went outside. The horses neighed in greeting. Vienna mounted her horse and felt the strain on her muscles and the tiredness in her limbs. Norris led the way at a fast trot into the fir forest. They soon arrived at a path and he turned onto it. The horses kept a steady pace and the slope became less steep. The trees thinned out and the gray sky gave way to a brighter hue. As Vienna emerged from the forest, the sun had risen and she could see the rolling foothills beneath her. At the edge of the hills where the gray valley began, she spotted a dark spot that she knew was the ranch house. Chapter 21 Around mid-morning, Vienna arrived at the ranch. Her guests had all made it there the previous night, and they were eager for her to join them and make sure she was doing well. They considered the end of the camping trip to be quite the adventure, and even declared it the cowboy's masterpiece trick. They thought Vienna's delay was all part of the plan to add to the grand finale. Vienna didn't bother correcting them or telling them that she had only been escorted home by one cowboy. Her guests shared their experience of a challenging ride down the mountain with only one exciting moment. As they were descending, they ran into Sheriff Haw and some of his deputies, who were clearly drunk and furious about Benita, the Mexican girl, escaping. Haw had been spewing insults at the ladies and, as Ambrose recounted, would have caused trouble for the group if the cowboys hadn't shut him down. It took Vienna's guests a full two days to recover from the grueling ride, and on the third day they began to leisurely prepare for their departure. This time was especially difficult for Vienna. She needed physical rest, but more pressingly she was grappling with a mental conflict that couldn't be ignored any longer. Her sister and friends were urging her to return with them back east, a prospect that Vienna herself desired. But it wasn't just about going back. It was about how, when, and under what circumstances she would return to the ranch and the West. Vienna needed to settle her future relationship with the land before she left. However, when the decisive moment arrived, Vienna realized that the West hadn't fully claimed her yet. Despite this, her old friends had rekindled dormant connections, and Vienna found herself torn. She would have welcomed any excuse to delay her decision, but fate intervened when Ken's letter arrived. He reported that his trip to California had been fruitful and he had a lucrative offer for Vienna from a major cattle company. Furthermore, he expressed his desire to marry Florence as soon as he returned home and would bring a minister from Adam for the occasion. Vienna made a promise to Melissa and her companions that she would return east soon, at the very latest, by Thanksgiving. They reluctantly accepted this assurance and bid farewell to Vienna and the ranch. However, just as they were about to leave, it appeared that their first leg of the journey home might hit a snag. When Link Stevens arrived with his big white car, all of Vienna's guests raised their hands in a western fashion. Link tried to assure them that he would drive safely and slowly, but Vienna had to guarantee his word and accompany them before they would enter the car. At the station, goodbyes were said, and Vienna promised for the hundredth time that they would be safe. Dorothy Coombs said her final words, asking Vienna to give her love to Monty Price and telling him that she was glad he kissed her. Melissa had a sweet, serious, yet mocking look in her eyes as she said, Princess, bring Norris with you when you come. He'll be the rage. Vienna treated the remark with the same lightness as the others, but after the train left and she was on her way home, she remembered Melissa's words and looks with a sense of shock. Any mention of Norris or thought of him displeased her. She wondered what Melissa meant and pondered. Melissa's mocking look had been an ironic glint, a cynical gleam from her worldly experience. The sweet gravity of Melissa's look had been more subtle and deeper. Vienna wanted to understand it, to find a new relation between Melissa and herself, something sisterly that could lead to love. However, the thought was poisoned by a strange suggestion of Norris, causing her to dismiss it. On the drive to the ranch, Vienna saw Norris walking along the shore of the lower lake. When he noticed the car, he quickly disappeared into the shade of the shrubbery. Vienna had seen him avoid her before, and although it gave her some relief, it also caused her pain. Vienna was avoiding Stilwell because she didn't want to hear him defend Norris. The old cattleman was upset and had tried to talk to Vienna about the foreman, but she refused to listen. Norris remained at the ranch, but his work suffered as Vienna grew colder towards him. 
She overheard conversations that confirmed her suspicions that Norris was slipping back into his old ways. Vienna couldn't bring herself to help him and felt a strange mix of emotions towards him. She didn't want to think about him and even felt a bit of scorn towards him. However, her brooding was interrupted by a telegram from Adam announcing the arrival of Ken and a minister which caused excitement among the cowboys. The wedding ceremony was set to take place in Vienna's grand hall chamber, while the dinner would be held in a charming patio scented with flowers. Ken and his minister arrived at the ranch in a large white car, looking windswept and disheveled. The minister was breathless and hatless, while Ken found it understandable why Nels disliked riding at such high speeds. Link, as usual, apologized to Vienna for being held up by a teamster and stray cattle, causing them to arrive later than expected. Ken expressed his approval of the wedding arrangements and requested that the cowboys attend. He also showed a keen interest in Florence and Vienna's guests, asking for more details about them. His eyes softened as he listened to Vienna talk, and he breathed a sigh of relief, remarking that he had been worried. Ken also expressed his fascination with the crags, a wild and almost inaccessible place near the border where guerrillas were known to gather. He wondered what the U.S. cavalry would think if they knew how close the guerrillas were to them. Sadly, Ken predicted that there would be more trouble with these guerrillas in the future, as Orozco, the rebel leader, had failed to withstand Madero's army. Currently, the Federals are occupying Chihuahua and pushing the rebels towards the north. Orozco has divided his army into guerrilla bands, which plan to engage in guerrilla warfare in Sonora. It's hard to say how this will affect us down here. However, we're too close to the border, and these guerrillas are dangerous night-riding hawks. They can cross the border, raid us, and be back on their side the same night. Fighting will not be limited to northern Mexico. With the revolution's failure, the guerrillas will become more numerous, bolder, and more desperate. Unfortunately, our location in this wilderness corner of the state makes us a favorable target for them. The next day, Ken and Florence tied the knot. Several of Florence's friends from El Cajon and her sister were present, along with Vienna, Stilwell, and his men. Ken wanted Norris to attend the ceremony. Vienna was amused when she saw the cowboys' suppressed excitement. For them, a wedding was an unusual and impressive event. She began to understand it better when they let loose and rushed forward to kiss the bride. Vienna had never seen a bride kissed so much and so heartily, nor one so flushed, disheveled, and happy. It was a joyous occasion. Ken Florentino was anything but an effete Easterner. He seemed like a Westerner his whole life. When Vienna managed to make her way through the crowd of cowboys to congratulate him, Ken gave her a bear hug and a kiss. This fascinated the cowboys. With shining eyes and glowing faces, they rushed towards Vienna with smiling, boyish boldness. For a moment she felt her heart leap to her throat. They looked like they could shamelessly kiss and maul her. Monty Price, that little, ugly-faced, soft-eyed, rude, tender-hearted ruffian, led the charge. He resembled a dragon driven by sentiment. Vienna felt torn between her natural aversion to the touch of unfamiliar hands and her desire to enjoy the company of the cowboys. However, when she caught sight of Norris at the back of the gathering, she was taken aback by the fierce, painful expression on his face. This look froze her willingness to be friendly, and she must have conveyed this change in demeanor to the group as Monty fell back and the cowboys made way for her to lead them into the patio. The dinner began with the cowboys feeling awkward and hungry, but hesitant to indulge in the feast before them. Wine soon loosened their tongues, and when Stilwell stood up to make a speech, they cheered him on. Stilwell was beaming with joy, nearly on the verge of tears. He spoke enthusiastically, raising his glass to toast the newlyweds and their love, happiness, prosperity, and good health. He also proposed a toast to the Union of the East and West, and claimed Al Florentino as one of their own. Stilwell then suggested they drink to his sister, the lady they hoped to make their princess, and the man who would come riding out of the West to win and keep her. He urged everyone to drink to their hopes and dreams. Just as Stilwell was about to take a drink, the sound of galloping hooves and a loud yell outside interrupted him. The patio fell silent, as if the air had been sucked out of the room. The sounds of horses stamping to a halt and men barking harsh orders, along with the low cry of a woman in pain, filtered in through the open doors and windows of Vienna's chamber. Nels strode into the room, 
surprising Vienna with his absence from the dinner table and the worried look on his face. Norris, you're needed outside, Nels said bluntly. Monty, come with me. The rest of you should probably stay inside and shut the doors. With that, Nels disappeared, Monty following quickly behind. Vienna trembled as she heard Monty's soft, swift steps pass from her room into her office. He had left his guns there. Norris got up quietly and left the patio, followed by Nick Steele. Stilwell dropped his wine glass, shattering the silence and causing his jovial demeanor to vanish. He went out and closed the door behind him. The moment had been rudely disrupted, and Vienna watched as the pleasure faded from the faces of her guests, replaced with the familiar hardness she had seen before. Ken, still somewhat confused by the sudden change, asked, "'What's going on?' "'I'm going to see who's butted in here to spoil our dinner,' Ken said, striding out of the room. He returned a few moments later, his forehead mottled with anger. "'It's Pat Haw, the sheriff of El Cajon. He's come to arrest Jean Norris, and they've got a poor little Mexican girl tied up on a horse outside.' "'Darn that sheriff!' Vienna exclaimed, rising from the table and ignoring Florence's pleas to stay put. The cowboys in the room stood up, but Ken blocked Vienna's path. "'I'm going out,' she told him. "'No, you're not,' he replied firmly. "'It's not safe out there.' "'I have to go,' Vienna insisted, looking directly at Ken. "'Vienna, what's going on?' Florence asked, concerned. "'There's going to be trouble outside,' Ken warned her. "'Maybe a fight. You can't do anything. You shouldn't go.' "'Maybe I can prevent the trouble,' Vienna replied, determined. She left the patio, aware that Ken, Florence, and the cowboys were following her. As she stepped onto the porch, she heard angry voices in the distance. When she saw Benita, bound and helpless on a horse, Vienna felt a mix of emotions. Her heart raced at the sight of the girl, but she was also filled with anger and pity. The man holding Benita's horse was the same gorilla who had found the wine basket at camp. He was bigger, redder, and drunker than before, and looked like a gorilla. Three other men were present, all on tired horses. The one in front, with a pointed beard and red eyes, was the El Cajon Sheriff. Vienna hesitated for a moment, but then stepped forward onto the porch. Ken, Florence, and several others followed her out. The rest of the cowboys and guests crowded the windows and doors. Stilwell saw Vienna and threw up his hands, roaring to be heard. This quieted the gesticulating, quarreling men. "'What's got you acting like a crazy steer on a rampage, Pat Haw?' demanded Stilwell. "'Stay in line, Bill,' replied Haw. "'You know why I'm here. "'I've been waiting for the right moment, and now I'm ready. "'I'm here to arrest a criminal.' "'The huge frame of the old cattleman jerked as if he had been stabbed. "'His face turned purple. "'Who's the criminal?' he shouted hoarsely. "'The sheriff flicked his quirt against his dirty boot, "'twisting his thin lips into a leer. "'The situation was agreeable to him. Why, Bill, I knew you had a no-good outfit riding this range, but I wasn't aware that you had more than one criminal. Cut the talk. Which cowboy are you trying to arrest? Haw's manner changed. Gene Norris, he replied curtly. What's the charge? For killing a Mexican one night last fall. So you're still harping on that? Pat, you're on the wrong trail. You can't pin that killing on Norris. It's ancient history by now. But if you insist on bringing him to court, let the arrest wait until after today's fiesta. We're having a celebration here, and I'll bring Jean to El Cajon. Nope. I reckon I'll take him when I get the chance before he runs off. I'm giving you my word, thundered Stilwell. I reckon I don't have to take your word, Bill, or anybody else's, replied Haw. Stilwell's great bulk quivered with rage, but he made a successful effort to control it. Listen here, Pat Haw, I know what's reasonable. Law is law, but in this country there's always been and still is a safe and sane way to proceed with the law. Maybe you've forgotten that. In a lawless land where one man holds all the power, even a respectable cattleman like myself can question the law. Let me give you a tip, Pat. You're not well liked around here. You've been too heavy-handed in your actions, and some of your dealings have been questionable. Don't overlook my words. But despite all that, you're still the sheriff, and I respect your position." I respect it enough to give you a warning. If your heart has turned sour and you can't find any kindness in it, then at least try to avoid any unpleasantness that may arise from your actions today. Do you understand what I'm saying? Stillwell, you're threatening an officer, replied Haw, his anger rising. Will you leave this place now? said Stillwell in a strained voice. 
I guarantee Norris will be in El Cajon any day you want. No, I came here to arrest him, and I will. So that's your game, shouted Stilwell. Well, we're glad to see your true colors, Pat. Listen here, you cheap red-eyed coyote of a sheriff. You don't seem to care how many enemies you make. You know you'll never hold office in this county again. What do you care now? It's strange how eager you are to hunt down the man who killed that particular greaser. I reckon there have been a dozen or more killings of greasers in the last year. Why don't you try to solve some of those cases? I'll tell you why. You're afraid to go near the border, and your hatred for Gene Norris makes you want to hound him and throw him in jail. You want to spite his friends. Well, listen here, you lean-jawed, skunk-bitten coyote. Go ahead and try to arrest him. With that, Stilwell took one giant step off the porch. His last words were cold, and his anger seemed to have transferred to Haw. The sheriff was getting flustered and waving his hand at the cattleman when Norris stepped in. Hold on, guys, let me say something, he said. As soon as Norris appeared, the Mexican girl snapped out of her daze. She struggled against her bonds, trying to lift her hands in a plea for help. Her face flushed with energy, and her big dark eyes lit up. Senor Jane, she cried, help me. They beat me, tied me up, and almost killed me. Oh, please, Senor Jane. Shut up, or I'll shut you up, the man holding Benita's horse threatened. Muzzle her, Sneed, if she talks again, Haw ordered. Vienna felt a tense energy building during the brief silence. Was it just her excitement? She looked at Nels, Monty, and Nick, their faces brooding, cold, and watchful. She wondered why Norris wasn't looking at Benita. He was now dark-faced, cool, and quiet, with an ominous presence about him. Haw, I'll surrender without any fuss if you take the ropes off the girl, Norris said slowly. No way, replied the sheriff. She got away from me once. She's hog-tied now, and she'll stay that way. Vienna thought she saw Norris flinch a little, but her vision was blurred and her heart was pounding. Okay, let's get out of here, Norris said. You've caused enough trouble. Ride down to the corral with me. I'll get my horse and go with you. Hold on, Haw yelled as Norris turned away. Not so fast. Who do you think you are? You're not pulling any stunts on me. You'll ride one of my pack horses and you'll be in shackles. You want to handcuff me? Norris asked, his passion suddenly flaring up. Is that what you want? Haw, haw. No, Norris, that's just how I deal with horse thieves, raiders, Mexicans, murderers, and the like. Get off your horse, Sneed, and put the cuffs on this man, ordered the gorilla. Sneed dismounted and rummaged through his saddlebags. You see, Bill, explained Haw, I hired Sneed specifically for this job. He's quite handy. He even caught that little Mexican cat for me. Stilwell didn't hear the sheriff. He was staring at Norris in disbelief. Gene, you're not going to let them handcuff you, he pleaded. Yes, replied the cowboy. Bill, my friend, I'm an outsider here. There's no need for Miss Florentino and her brother in Florence to be further worried about me. Their happy day has already been ruined on my account. I want to leave quickly. Well, you might be too considerate of Miss Florentino's feelings, sneered the rancher. What about my feelings? Are you going to let this sneaky coyote, this last gasp of the old rum-guzzling frontier sheriffs, put you in cuffs and hog-tie you and haul you off to jail? Yes, Norris said firmly. By God, Eugene Norris, what's happened to you? Go inside and I'll take care of this guy. Tomorrow you can turn yourself in like a gentleman. No, I'll go now. Thanks, Bill, for your support. Hurry, Haw, before I change my mind. As Norris spoke, his voice broke. It was clear he had been holding back his emotions. A sense of hopelessness and shame overtook him, and Vienna saw the man she once knew. The passion inside her erupted in a woman's fierce refusal to accept Norris's broken spirit. She didn't want him to break the law, but she couldn't bear to see him deny his masculinity. She had once begged him to become a cowboy like her, a man who was tempered by reason and passion. She had shown him how violence was painful and shocking to her. This idea had consumed him, making him soft and weak. It had grown on him like a lichen, stifling his will and robbing him of his wild and bold spirit that she now strangely longed to see him feel. When Sneed came forward with the iron fetters, Vienna's blood boiled. She would have forgiven Norris for being the kind of cowboy she had once despised. This was a man's West, a man's game. What right did a woman raised in a softer world have to use her beauty and influence to change a man who was bold, free, and strong? At that moment, with her blood racing, Vienna would have gloried in the violence she had once deplored. She would have welcomed the action that characterized Norris's treatment of Don Carlos. 
She had suddenly acquired the temperament of a woman who had absorbed the life and nature around her, and who would not have turned her eyes away from a harsh and bloody act. But Norris held out his hands to be handcuffed. Then Vienna heard her own voice shouting, Wait! In the time it took her to walk a few steps to the porch's edge facing the men, she felt her anger, justice, and pride summoning forces to her command. But there was something else calling her, a deep, passionate, mysterious thing that was not born of the moment. Sneed dropped the handcuffs. Norris's face turned white as a sheet. Haw, in a slow and stupid embarrassment beyond his control, removed his hat in a respect that seemed to be wrenched from him. Listen, Haw, I can prove to you that Norris had nothing to do with the crime you're trying to arrest him for, Vienna exclaimed confidently. The sheriff's expression changed from confusion to surprise, and he tried to speak but couldn't find the words. Clearly he was thrown off balance. Vienna continued speaking. It's impossible for Norris to have been involved in the assault because he was with me in the train station waiting room when it happened. I have a vivid memory of the entire incident. The door was open and I could hear the voices of men arguing outside. They were speaking Spanish and I could also hear a woman's voice begging for something. Then I heard footsteps approaching and I knew Norris heard them too. His face was tense with anticipation. Suddenly there were loud, angry voices, a scuffle, a shot, a woman's scream, a thud, and the sound of someone running away. Then Benita, the girl who was involved in the quarrel, stumbled into the room. She was white as a sheet, shaking with fear. When she saw Norris, she recognized him and begged for help. Norris tried to comfort her and asked if Danny Maines had been shot or if he had done the shooting. Benita said no and explained that she had danced and flirted with some vaqueros, which led to the argument. Norris then took her outside and helped her onto his horse. I watched as they rode away into the darkness. As Vienna spoke, Haw's demeanor began to change once again. He didn't stay disconcerted for long, but his discomfort turned into a sullen rage and his sharp features twisted into a crafty expression. That's mighty interesting, Miss Florentino, almost as interesting as a storybook, he said. Now, since you're such an obliging witness, I'd sure like to ask you a couple of questions. What time did you get to El Cajon that night? It was after eleven o'clock, Vienna replied. Nobody was there to meet you? No. The station agent and operator were both gone? Yes. Well, how soon did this guy Norris show up? Haw continued with a wry smile. Very soon after I arrived, I think perhaps fifteen minutes, possibly a little more, Vienna answered. It was dark and lonely around that station, wasn't it? Indeed, yes. And what time was the Mexican guy shot? Haw asked, his little eyes gleaming like coals. Probably close to half past one. It was two o'clock when I looked at my watch at Florence Kingsley's house. Right after Norris sent Benita away, he took me to Miss Kingsley's. So, allowing for the walk and a few minutes' conversation with her, I can pretty definitely say the shooting took place at about half past one, Vienna explained. Stillwell stepped closer to the sheriff. What are you driving at? he roared, his face turning black again. Evidence, snapped Haw. Vienna was surprised by this interruption. As Norris drew her gaze, she saw him gray-faced as ashes, shaking, completely unnerved. I thank you, Miss Florentino, he said huskily. But you needn't answer any more of Haw's questions. He's, he's, it's not necessary. I'll go with him now, under arrest. Benita will corroborate your testimony in court, and that will save me from this, this man's spite. Vienna looked at Norris and saw a humility she initially mistook for cowardice. Suddenly she realized it wasn't fear for himself that made him dread further disclosures of that night, but fear for her, fear of the shame she might suffer through him. Pat Haw tilted his head to the side, eyeing Vienna like a vulture about to swoop down. What you said is important and conclusive as testimony, but the court will want an explanation for why you were alone with Norris in the waiting room from 11.30 until 1.30, he said in a deliberate manner. Vienna noticed a remarkable reaction from Norris, Stillwell, Ken, and Monty Price. Norris gave a sudden start. Stillwell tore at his shirt collar. Ken strode forward but was stopped by Nels, and Monty Price let out a violent awe that sounded like both a hiss and a roar. Vienna didn't know what to make of it at the time, but it felt ominous. She felt a chill run down her spine as she prepared to respond to Haw. Norris detained me in the waiting room, Vienna said in a clear voice but we were not alone the entire time. There was a gasp from Norris and a look of hideous amazement and joy on Haw's face. 
How is that possible? Hall whispered, craning his neck. Norris was drunk, Vienna replied. Norris let out a passionate gesture of despair and begged her not to say any more. He seemed to sink down in shame and Stillwell put a hand on his shoulder. The old cattleman turned to Vienna and said, Miss Princess, it would be wise to tell everything. None of us would misunderstand any motive or act of yours. Maybe a stroke of lightning could clear this murky air. Whatever Jean Norris did that unlucky night, you should tell it. Vienna felt her dignity and self-possession slip away in the face of Norris's importunity. She spoke quickly and urgently, saying, He came into the station a few minutes after I got there. I asked to be shown to a hotel. He said there wasn't any that would accommodate married women. He grabbed my hand and looked for a wedding ring. Then I saw that he was intoxicated. He told me he would go get a hotel porter, but instead he came back with a priest, Padre Marcos. The poor priest was terribly frightened, and so was I. Norris had turned into a devil. He fired his gun at the Padre's feet and pushed me onto a bench. He shot right in front of my face, and I nearly fainted. But I heard him cursing the Padre while the Padre was praying or chanting I didn't know what. Norris tried to make me say things in Spanish. All at once he asked my name, and I told him. He jerked at my veil, and I took it off. Then he threw his gun down and pushed the Padre out of the door. That was just before the vaqueros approached with Bonita. Padre Marcos must have seen them and heard them. After that, Norris quickly sobered up. He was mortified, distressed, and stricken with shame. He told me he had been drinking at a wedding, Ed Linton's wedding, I remember. Then he explained that the boys were always gambling, and he wagered that he would marry the first girl who arrived at El Cajon. I happened to be the first one. He tried to force me to marry him. The rest, relating to the assault on the vaquero, I have already told you. Vienna finished speaking out of breath and panting with her hands pressed against her chest. The revelation of her secret had liberated her emotions, and her hurried words had made her throb and tremble and burn. Strangely, she thought of Ken and his anger, but he stood motionless, as if dazed. Stillwell was trying to holster up the crushed Norris, and Hall rolled his red eyes and threw back his head. Ha, 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 ha! Sneed and his friend laughed heartily, enjoying the story they had just heard. That's the best one I've ever heard in my life, Sneed exclaimed. His friend agreed with him, laughing uncontrollably. Suddenly their laughter ceased, and the friend turned to Vienna with a vicious and insolent look. Well now, my lady, he said, if your story matches with Bonita and Padre Marcos's, it might just clear Jean Norris in the eyes of the court. But don't expect them to believe that you were detained against your will. Vienna was taken aback by his words, and before she could fully comprehend their meaning, Norris had jumped up, his face as white as a sheet. He lunged at Haw, but Stillwell, a large and imposing figure, intervened and restrained Norris with his arms. There was a brief but intense struggle, with Norris appearing to be getting the upper hand. Help, boys, help! Stillwell called out. I can't hold him. Hurry, or there's going to be blood spilled. Several cowboys rushed to Stillwell's aid, but Norris managed to toss them aside one by one. They closed in on him, and the sound of their powerful bodies clashing filled the air. Norris heaved them off him at one point, but they quickly regained control and subdued him. Gene, why, Gene! Stillwell exclaimed, panting heavily. You're crazy to act this way. Just calm down. It's me, your old pal Bill, who's tried to be a father to you. I just want you to have some sense and wait. Let me go, let me go, Norris cried out, and the sound of his anguish pierced Vienna's heart. Let me go, Bill, if you're my friend. I saved your life once in the desert. You swore you'd never forget. Boys, make him let me go, Jean cried out, his voice filled with anger and frustration. I don't care what Hawes said or done to me, it was that about her. Are you all a bunch of cowards? How can you just stand there and watch this happen? Damn you all! Jean's voice trailed off to a whisper as he pleaded with Bill. Bill, dear old Bill, please let me go. I'll kill him. You know I will. Stillwell tried to calm Jean down. Jean, I know you'd kill him if you had the chance, he said. But Jean, you're not even carrying a gun. And there's Pat looking ready to shoot. He knows you're unarmed and would jump at the chance to take you out. Cool down, son. It'll all work out. Suddenly, Vienna heard a terrifying sound. Monty Price had leaped off the porch and was now crouching down, his hands on his hips where his guns hung. He let out a roar that sounded like a mix of a bellow and an Indian war whoop. His eyes were fixed on Haw and Sneed, and he looked like a demon about to attack. Stillwell quickly pushed the other cowboys onto the porch and tried to move Vienna, Ken, and Florence to safety. 
He stood between the women in danger, his movements quick and decisive. Vienna could feel her heart racing as she watched Monty. She knew that something terrible was about to happen, and she clung to Stilwell's arm for support. Monty called out to Haw and Sneed, warning them not to move a muscle. Vienna's senses were heightened, and she knew that danger was all around them. She understood the reason behind Monty's agonizing scream and his odd hunched posture. Stilwell's quickness and silence also hinted at impending disaster. "'Nels, get over here!' Monty shouted, never once taking his eyes off of Haw and his deputy. "'Nels, chase those two guys away from there. Hurry!' Without waiting for Nels, the two deputies who had been lingering in the background with the pack horses spurred their mounts and galloped away. "'Nels, release the girl!' Monty commanded. Nels ran over, snatched the halter out of Sneed's hand, and pulled Benita's horse close to the porch. As he sliced the rope that had been restraining her, she fell into his arms. "'Haw, get down!' Monty continued. Face forward and stand still. The sheriff dismounted, his face ashen and his hands never moving. Line up next to your partner in crime. There. The two of you make a fine picture, a perfect pair of sick coyotes mixed with a wild mule and a Mexican. Listen up. Monty paused for a long moment, his breathing heavy and audible. Vienna's gaze was fixed on Monty. Her mind quickly processed the nuances of his actions and words as he controlled the men. Violence, brutal violence, the very thing she had sensed, feared, and tried to eradicate from her cowboys, was finally about to happen before her eyes. It had come at last. She had softened Stillwell, influenced Nels, and changed Norris. However, this little dark-faced, fearsome Monty Price had emerged from his wild past, and nothing on earth or in heaven could stop him. The harsh existence of untamed men in an untamed land was about to strike a blow against her. She didn't flinch. She didn't want to erase from her sight this little man who was terrifying in his mood of wild justice. She felt a flash of horror that Monty, blind and indifferent to her authority, cold as steel towards her presence, understood the depths of a woman's soul. For in this moment of strife, of insult to her, of torture to the man she had uplifted and then broken, the passion within her reached deep towards primitive hate. With eyes slowly turning red, she watched Monty Price. She listened with ears pounding. She waited, slowly sagging against Stillwell. "'Haw, if you and your dirty partner have loved the sound of a human voice, then listen and listen hard,' said Monty. "'Because I've been going against my old style just to have a talk with you. You almost got away on your nerve, didn't you? Why, you roll in here like a mad steer and flash your badge and talk mean, then almost bluff away with it. You heard all about Miss Florentino's cowboy outfit stopping drinking and cursing and carrying guns.' They've taken on religion and decent living, and sure they'll be easy to hobble and drive to jail. Haw, oh, listen. There was a good, noble, and beautiful woman who came out of the East somewhere, and she brought a lot of sunshine and happiness and new ideas into the tough lives of cowboys. I reckon it's beyond you to know what she came to mean to them. Well, I'll tell you. They all went clean out of their heads. They all got soft and easy and sweet-tempered. They got so they couldn't kill a coyote, a crippled calf in a mud hole. They took to books and writing home to mother and sister and to saving money and to getting married. Once they were only a lot of poor cowboys, and then suddenly they were human beings living in a big world that had something sweet even for them. Even for an old, worn-out, hobble-legged, burnt-out cowboy like myself, do you understand? And you, Mr. Haw, you come along not satisfied with roping and beating and God knows what else of that friendless little Benita. You come along and face the lady we fellas honor, love and revere. And you, you hell's fire. With a whistling breath, Monty Price crouched lower, hands at his hips, and he edged inch by inch farther out from the porch, closer to Haw and Sneed. Vienna saw them only in the blurred fringe of her sight. They resembled specters. She heard the shrill whistle of a horse and recognized Princess calling her from the corral. "'That's all!' roared Monty, his voice now strangling. Lower and lower he bent, a terrible figure of ferocity. Now, both you armed officers of the law, come on, flash your guns, throw them, and be quick. Monty Price is done. There'll be daylight through you both before you fan a hammer. But I'm giving you a chance to sting me. You holler law, and my way is the old law. His breath came quicker, his voice grew hoarser, and he crouched lower. All his body except his rigid arms quivered with a wonderful muscular convulsion. Dogs! Skunks! Buzzards! Flash them guns, or I'll flash mine! Aha! To Vienna it seemed the three stiff crouching men leaped into instant and united action. 
She saw streaks of fire, streaks of smoke. Then a crashing volley deafened her. It ceased as quickly. Smoke veiled the scene. Slowly it drifted away to disclose three fallen men, one of whom, Monty, leaned on his left hand, a smoking gun in his right. He watched for a movement from the other two. It did not come. Then with a terrible smile he slid back and stretched out. Chapter 22 Day and night, Vienna Florentino found herself unable to shake off the haunting memory of the tragedy that occurred. Monty Price's horrifying smile played over and over in her mind, leaving her feeling unsettled and disturbed. Vienna knew that the only way to escape her troubles was to keep herself busy. She spent her days working, walking, and riding. She even put aside her aversion to the Mexican girl Bonita, who was sick and in need of nursing. Vienna felt a change in her soul, but she couldn't pinpoint what it was. The struggle to decide whether to go east or west still weighed heavily on her mind. However, she never felt spiritually alone because she sensed someone following her. Being indoors made her feel oppressed, so she craved the open air, the sight of the endless landscape, and the sounds of the corral and pond. One afternoon she rode down to the alfalfa fields, circled them, and rode back up to the spillway of the lower lake. There she found a group of mesquite trees that had taken on new life due to the water that seeped through the sand to their roots. Vienna dismounted and rested under the trees, enjoying the solitude of the secluded spot. Her horse, Princess, was restless, but Vienna was content to sit with her back against a tree, feeling the cool breeze on her face. She heard the slow tramp of cattle going to drink and then silence, except for the sound of her and Princess. After a moment of observation, she discovered that the area was far from lifeless. Her sharp senses were rewarded. Desert quail, as gray as the barren earth, were cleaning themselves in a shady spot. A bee, quick as lightning, buzzed past. She noticed a horned toad, the color of rock, crouching low and hiding fearfully in the sand within range of her whip. She extended the whip's point, and the toad shook and expanded and hissed. It was brimming with fight. The wind barely stirred the thin branches of the mesquites, producing a mournful sigh. From far up in the foothills, barely visible, came the cry of an eagle. The bray of a burrow caused a short, jarring interruption. Then a brown bird swooped down from an unseen perch and chased a fluttering winged insect in a swift, erratic flight. Vienna heard the sound of a merciless beak snapping. Indeed, there was more than just life in the mesquite's shadow. Suddenly, Princess perked up his long ears and snorted. Vienna heard the slow thud of hooves. A horse was approaching from the direction of the lake. Vienna had learned to be cautious, and she turned Princess toward the open, mounting him. A moment later she was grateful for her prudence, because looking back through the trees, she watched as Norris led a horse into the grove. She would have rather encountered a gorilla than this cowboy. Princess broke into a trot when a sharp whistle pierced the air. The horse jumped, and, turning so quickly that he almost threw Vienna off, he charged straight back towards the mesquites. Vienna spoke to him, screamed at him in anger, pulled on the reins with all her might, but was helpless to stop him. He whistled a shrill blast. Vienna then realized that Norris, his former master, had called him, and that nothing could deter him. Vienna had given up her attempts to stop Princess from thrashing mesquite boughs and instead focused on intercepting them. The horse charged into an aisle between the trees and halted before Norris, letting out an eager whinny. Vienna was amazed and unsure of what to expect. With a quick glance, she saw Norris dressed in rough garb, ready for the trail, leading a wiry horse that was saddled and packed. Norris put his arm around Princess's neck without acknowledging Vienna's presence and laid his face against the flowing mane. Vienna's heart began to beat faster as she realized that Norris was saying goodbye to his horse. She was moved by the love between man and beast and felt a dimness in her eyes that she quickly brushed away, only for it to return wet and blurring. She looked away, afraid that Norris might see her tears. She felt sorry for him, knowing that he was leaving the ranch, and this time it was for good. A sharp pain shot through Vienna's heart like a stab from a cold blade. The wonder of it, the incomprehensibility of it, and the utter newness and strangeness of this sharp pain made her forget Norris, her surroundings, and everything except to search her heart. Maybe this was the secret that had eluded her. She trembled on the brink of something unknown. The emotion brought back her girlhood, and her mind raced with questions and answers. She was living, feeling, and learning. Happiness mocked her from behind a barred door, 
and the bar of that door seemed to be an inexplicable pain. Questions raced through her mind like lightning. Why should pain hide her happiness? What was her happiness? Vienna was left wondering what relation this man had to her and why she felt so strange about his departure. The voices within her remained unanswered and silenced. Suddenly Norris approached her and Vienna turned to face him. She saw the earlier version of Norris, the one who reminded her of their first meeting at El Cajon and their memorable meeting at Chiricahua. I want to talk to you, Norris stated. I want to ask you something. I've been wanting to know something. That's why I've hung on here. You never spoke to me, never noticed me, never gave me a chance to ask you. But now I'm going over the border, and I want to know. Why did you refuse to listen to me? His words caused a hot shame to rush over Vienna, tenfold more stifling than before. She realized she was face to face with him, and a shame that she would rather have died than revealed was being liberated. She bit her lips to hold back speech, jerked on Princess's bridle, struck him with her whip, and spurred him. However, Norris's iron arm held the horse. Then, in a flash of passion, Vienna struck at Norris's face, missed, struck again, and hit. With one swift pull, he tore the whip from her hands, almost drawing her from the saddle. It was not the action on his part or the sudden strong masterfulness of his look that quieted her fury, but the livid mark on his face where the whip had lashed. That's nothing, he said with something of his old audacity. That's nothing to how you've hurt me. Vienna battled with herself for control. This man would not be denied. Never before had the hardness of his face, the flinty hardness of these desert-bred men, so struck her with its revelation of the unbridled spirit. He looked stern, haggard, and bitter. The once dark shade was slowly transitioning to gray, then to a dull ash color, as Norris's passion burned within him. The man before Vienna was not the same gentle soul she had helped shape. His piercing eyes bore into her as if searching her very soul. Vienna could sense a fleeting doubt, a tinge of sadness, and an overall sense of realization in Norris's eyes. Her intuition told her that he had come to a painful and final truth. For the third time, Norris posed the question to Vienna, and she remained silent, unable to speak. He continued, his voice filled with passion, Do you not know that I love you? That since the day I first laid eyes on you at Chiricahua, I have loved you? Can you not see that I have changed, that I have become a better man because of you? I have worked for you, lived for you, and loved you, but you never knew. I turned my back on the wildlife and have become an honorable and decent man. All for you, my cowboy angel, my holy virgin. Norris's words were filled with emotion, and Vienna could feel the love and sincerity in his voice. He continued, You know nothing of a man's heart and soul. How could you understand the love and salvation of a man who had lived his life in silence and loneliness? I was a wild cowboy, faithless to my mother and sister, riding a hard, drunken trail straight to hell. But when I looked into your eyes, I saw a beautiful woman beyond me, above me, and I loved you so much that I was saved. I became faithful again, and I saw your face in every flower and your eyes in the blue heaven. Vienna listened to Norris's words, her heart aching with a newfound understanding of the man before her. She knew that he had loved her all along, and she felt the weight of his love and sacrifice. Under the vast expanse of the western stars at night, I felt an overwhelming sense of gratitude for simply being alive and having the opportunity to assist you. Being near you and shielding you from worry, trouble, and danger made me feel like I was a small part of the West that you had grown to love. Vienna remained silent, her heart pounding in her chest. Norris suddenly lunged at her and grabbed her arm, causing her to tremble. His actions hinted at his previous instinctual violence. You think that I kept Benita hidden in the mountains, that I secretly met with her, and that while I served you I was... He paused, his voice rising in anger. I know what you think. I never knew until I made you look at me. Now say it. Speak. Vienna, consumed by passion, unable to control her words, blurted out a shameful and revealing confession. Yes! Norris had forced the word out of her, but he was not perceptive enough to understand the deeper meaning of her response. To him the word only confirmed his dishonor in her eyes. He released her arm and stepped back, a surprising action for the savage and unrefined man she believed him to be. But at Chiricahua you spoke of faith, he exclaimed. You said the greatest thing in the world was faith in human nature. You said that the finest men were those who had fallen low and had risen again. 
You said you had faith in me. You made me have faith in myself. His reproach, free of bitterness or disdain, struck at Vienna's egoistic belief in her own righteousness. She had preached a beautiful principle that she had failed to live up to. She understood his criticism and was in a state of confusion, but her pride had been wounded too deeply and her emotions were too intense. She couldn't speak and the moment passed along with his brief moment of honesty. You think I'm a terrible person, he said. You think that about Benita, and all this time I've been... His passionate words ended abruptly as he clenched his teeth. His lips formed a thin, bitter line, and his face became agitated as he struggled internally. He gasped as if he was resisting a strong temptation, then suddenly stood upright. But I'll be the man the dog you think I am. He grabbed her arm with a rough, powerful grip, pulling her halfway out of the saddle and into his arms. She fell against him, not entirely free of the stirrups or horse where she hung, completely powerless. She struggled and writhed, attempting to free herself, but all she could do was twist herself and raise herself enough to see his face. It almost paralyzed her. Was he going to kill her? Then he wrapped his arms around her and held her tighter and closer to him. She felt the pounding of his heart. Hers seemed to have frozen. He pressed his burning lips to hers in a long, terrible kiss. She felt him tremble. Oh, Norris, I beg you, let me go, she whispered. His white face loomed over hers, and she closed her eyes. He kissed her face repeatedly, but not on her mouth. He pressed his lips to her closed eyes, her hair, her cheeks, and her neck, and they lost their heat and became cold. He released her, lifting her back into the saddle while still holding her arm to prevent her from falling. Vienna sat with her eyes closed, dreading the light. Now you can't say you've never been kissed, Nora said, his voice seeming distant. But that was coming to you, so be game. Here. He placed something hard and cold in her hand, making her fingers close around it. The sensation of the object revived her, and she opened her eyes to see Norris standing with his broad chest against her knee, a mocking smile on his face. Go ahead, throw my gun on me, be a thoroughbred. Vienna didn't yet understand his meaning. You can put me down in that quiet place on the hill beside Monty Price. She dropped the gun with a horrified cry. The memory of Monty, the certainty that she would kill Norris if she held the gun any longer, tormented her with self-accusation. Norris picked up the weapon. You might have saved me a hell of a lot of trouble, he said with another mocking smile. You're beautiful and sweet and proud, but you're no thoroughbred. Princess Florentino, adios. Norris leaped onto his horse and crashed through the mesquites, disappearing from sight. Chapter 23 in the secluded comfort of her bedroom, Vienna Florentino lay face down on her plush couch, overwhelmed with the violation she had endured. As the afternoon passed by and twilight approached, Vienna finally rose from her position to sit by the window, hoping the cool breeze would soothe her flushed face. For hours she struggled with feelings of shame, anger, and helplessness, trying to make sense of the unspeakable act that had left her feeling defiled. The trail of stars in the sky seemed to taunt her with their unattainable calmness. Vienna Florentino had once adored them, but now she despised them and everything that had to do with the wild, unpredictable West. Lorraine Wayne had been right. This was no place for her. The decision to go back home came naturally, with no inner turmoil. She even felt relieved at the thought of leaving. However, the stars still held a strange allure for her. They were beautiful, yet mocking, drawing her in. She sighed, realizing that it wouldn't be easy to leave them after all. Vienna shut the window, plunging the room into darkness. She lit a candle, but didn't want to be disturbed by the servants who were knocking on her door. She heard a soft footstep outside and wondered if it was Nels, Nick Steele, or Stillwell, who now watched over her since Monty Price and that other man were gone. She couldn't believe she was regretting him, but the darkness suited her mood. She tried to sleep, but her cheeks burned with a shameful heat. She got up to wash her face, but the cold water didn't ease the burning sensation. She lay back down, grateful for the cover of night. Norris's kisses lingered on her lips, eyes, and neck. Despite his betrayal, she knew he had loved her. Vienna had a restless night and woke up feeling drained, but she was mentally prepared to face the day. She arrived at her office later than usual and found Stillwell waiting for her outside. Good morning, Miss Princess, he greeted her politely, though his face betrayed his worry.
Vienna braced herself for the usual complaints about Norris, but was surprised to see a shabby pony and a small donkey with heavy loads in the yard. Whose animals are these? she asked. Danny Maines, replied Stilwell, coughing and looking uneasy. Danny Maines? Vienna repeated, puzzled. Yes, ma'am, he confirmed. Stilwell was acting strangely, and Vienna sensed that something was amiss. Is Danny Maines here? she asked, suddenly curious. Stilwell nodded gravely. Yes, he's here, and he came asking for Benita. He's crazy about that little black-eyed girl. He hardly said hello to me before he started asking all sorts of wild questions. I took him to see Benita, and he's been with her for over half an hour now. Stilwell's feelings were hurt, and Vienna was taken aback by the news. Her curiosity turned to disbelief, and she felt a sudden thrill of anticipation. A few moments later, a young man with a cowboy's build, attire, and swagger appeared on the porch. He had a clear brown tan, curly light hair, and blue eyes, and he was handsome and straightforward. He slammed his hat down and rushed to Vienna, grabbing her hands. The sudden and forceful actions of the cowboy caused her to feel uneasy, bringing back memories she wanted to forget. He lowered his head and kissed her hands, squeezing them tightly. When he stood back up, tears streamed down his face. Miss Florentino, she's safe and almost well, and what I feared most didn't happen, thank God, he exclaimed, crying. I'll never be able to repay you for all you've done for her. She told me how she was taken here, how Jean tried to save her, how you spoke up for Jean and her, and how Monty finally surrendered his guns. Poor Monty. He was my friend, but he did it for her. Monty Price was the most honorable man I ever knew. Nels, Nick, and Jean have been great friends to me, but Monty Price was grand. He never knew, just like you, Bill, and the boys, what Benita meant to me. Stilwell placed his large hand on the cowboy's shoulder. Danny, what are you talking about? he asked. And you're taking liberties with Miss Florentino, whom you've never met before. I'll excuse your strange behavior since you're not drinking. Maybe you're going crazy. Come on, calm down and talk sense. The cowboy smiled, his honest face breaking into a grin. He wiped the tears from his eyes and laughed, a joyous and youthful sound. Bill, old friend, give me a minute, he said, then turned to Vienna. I apologize, Miss Florentino, for my impoliteness. My name is Danny Maines, and Benita is my wife. I'm ecstatic that she's safe and unharmed, and I'm so grateful to you that it's a wonder I didn't kiss you right then and there. Benita is your wife? Stilwell exclaimed. Of course, we've been married for months, Danny replied, beaming. Jean Norris married us. That guy is great at getting people hitched. Maybe I ain't paid him back yet for all he's done for me. You see, I've been in love with Benita for two years. And Jean, you know, Bill, he's got away with girls. He was trying to convince Benita to be with me, Vienna exclaimed. Her emotions shifted quickly, but she was filled with gratitude towards the cowboy in front of her. Danny Maines had brought her some great news, and she couldn't help but feel grateful. Danny Maines, Vienna exclaimed with a smile. If you are as happy as your news has made me, and if you really think I deserve such a reward, you may kiss me. Danny bashfully but eagerly took her up on the offer. Stillwell snorted, but Vienna knew it was just his way of showing approval. Bill, grab a chair, Danny said. You've been worrying too much about your bad boys, Danny and Jean. You'll need to sit down for this story. He motioned for Vienna to take a seat as well. Miss Florentino, I hope you don't mind listening. You have a face and eyes that love to hear about other people's happiness. And somehow it's just easier for me to talk when I'm looking at you. His demeanor changed as he walked off the porch and approached his tired horse and burrow. Played out, he exclaimed as he quickly removed the pack from the burrow and threw the saddle and bridle from the horse with a swift, violent motion. Look over there, exclaimed Danny, pointing towards the horizon. That's the last time you'll ever have to carry a heavy load like that. You've been loyal to me, and now I'm going to repay you. No more saddles, straps, halters, or hobbles for you. From now on, you'll only be surrounded by grass, clover, cool water, and dusty swales to roll around in and rest. He then proceeded to untie the pack and take out a small heavy bag. Danny dumped the contents of the bag at Stillwell's feet. Piece after piece of rock thumped onto the floor, sharp and ragged with yellow veins and bars and streaks. Stillwell picked up the rocks one by one, staring and stuttering in amazement. He put the rocks to his lips and dug into them with his shaking fingers. He lay back in his chair with his head against the wall and a smile began to form on his face. Lord, Danny, you've gone and struck it rich, exclaimed Stillwell. 
Danny looked at Stilwell with a superior attitude. I'm some rich, he said. Now what do we have here, Bill? Oh, Lord, Danny, I'm afraid to say, replied Stilwell. Just look at the gold, Miss Princess. I've been around prospectors and gold mines for thirty years, but I've never seen anything like this. The lost mine of the Padres, shouted Danny in a loud voice, and it belongs to me. Stilwell sat up fascinated, completely beside himself.